the first appearance of the new art in Vienna was called Ver Sacrum, the Sacred Spring. So about 100 years later, it's a second spring. I wonder if it's sacred. I, at least it feels it has a certain tinge of sacredness. Which brings me to you, Tracy, and um, the first question as a side entrance, so to say, is um, why actually you accepted our invitation or had the wish <laughs> to come to Vienna and do a show with Egon Schiele at the Leopold Museum? I know that Dieter's teasing me because there wasn't an invitation. I came and banged on the door and screamed. <laughs> so, and we just made the show that she stops. <laughs> but, um, no, I've... I've uh, we, we're very worried about repeating ourselves within this conversation, but I think it is important that I explain this again. Since I was about 14 or 15, I've liked Egon Sheila's work. And it was like a, a, an amazing, life-changing experience for me when I first came, saw, saw images in a book. Because previously to that, I was only aware of, say, like Picasso, Andy Warhol. And it's funny, I'd just been over to the pop art show and I was looking at, at the Liechtensteins and the Warhols and I was going, oh, so pleased I'm over there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is my heart. This is where I belong with this like um, torture, torment, emotion, expression, feeling, angst, passion, sex. You know, this is where my heart lies, my work. And so when I first saw the, the Sheila's, I immediately responded and thought, yeah, this, this is it. This is art. This is what art should look like. I, I understand this. And suddenly in my life, a door opened for me, which made it possible for me to actually have an education and, and have a direction. So that's why I come banging on your door and I accepted your invitation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, from, the, from the beginning, uh, we were thinking about the dialogue between the two artists. And I want to thank especially to Karol Vinyacic, who worked closely with Tracy Emin and the Tracy Emin studio on this. And I think from the beginning it was clear that we don't just, we don't work on similarities of motives or similarity of shapes but looked for something deeper um, as a meeting point between you and Sheila. Well, one, one of my, another reason why I really wanted to do this show is because um, whenever I see Sheila's work in different places around the world, or say like in the Neu Museum or, or where, where, wherever, and recently at the Coulthard Institute in London, they're always hung like wallpaper. They're always just like 10 in a row. And so you go to the show and you just nod. You go, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And I think that um, his work is interpreted internationally in, in, in the wrong way. Like he's the person who does the small erotic gouaches. And of course, Ikon Schiller is not the person who did this, you know, the small erotic gouaches. He is the man who was actually challenging and redefining what our moral compass was within terms of art, which was really, it's still really important today. And I think that when they're all hung in a row, we, we lose it, we lose the power. So I also really, and Carol as well, our first idea was to give Egon Schiller space, let his work breathe. And through that, let my work breathe and let there be a dialogue between us. So with the show, it isn't just the works that you look at, but the space that it sounds pretentious, but it's true, the space that's in between, that's as important. Yeah, and we wholeheartedly embraced uh, this way of seeing Chile. There was one uh, first try at this museum at the 10th anniversary of the Leopold Museum in 2011. We had a Chile show called uh, Melancholy and Provocation. And I had six rooms reserved for a dialogue between living artists and Chile. So there was a it was a first 
try to have Shi Le Hang differently and so to say um, single works by itself. But not on this scale, especially when uh, you come into the first room, you see the roller coaster, you see a neon by Tracy Emin, and then you see a small oil painting, one oil painting which we incorporated in the show, the mountain by the river. Why did you take this small painting on? I mean, it is a good question because I could have had a big painting. Um, I really love that painting and to me it says as much about self-portrait as what actually a self-portrait does. I, when I look at that painting I see like a, a soul in it and I see something really melancholy like this yellow sort of orangey sun that just looks like it's crying. It's such a sad painting and I, it resonates for me. It beats. It has, has real movement. And also, I mean, I kind of really like the idea that, you know, big isn't always powerful. And I like the fact that that one painting can hold that whole wall. It, it is, it's a really, it was, it's, for me, it's very poetic and magical. So is the roller coaster for you a melancholy thing? It, I think the roller coaster here looks so melancholy. It's, and also it looks tiny. And when we originally was... Um, talking about putting the roller coaster in I was we was I was saying things like oh we might have to chop it down we might have to make it smaller I was I in, in my mind the roller coaster is ginormous you know and it's actually so tiny in that room and so spindly and I love seeing it from the window above because it actually looks like one of my drawings like the line of my drawing like um kind of blown up like a million times but the roller coaster when where I grew up in Margate in England, um, there's a, a scenic railway, which is this wooden wooden roller coaster, this wooden railway, and it's the, one of the oldest grade two listed wooden constructions. And for me, it's really beautiful, and it kind of has this sort of kind of surreal, kind of dreamlike thing. And I did have, I used to constantly have dreams about it. And about ten years ago, I dreamt that I was on top of the roller coaster scenic railway and the train and the train stopped but it stopped at about 500 feet you know 500 meters in the air and my only way to climb down was to climb down this to get off was to climb down this giant penis and this penis was so big that I could hold I was holding onto the veins of the penis to climb down and when I woke up I thought this was a really amusing dream and so Freudian it was like so corny, it was like, like ridiculous. This was the call from Vienna. Yes, definitely, yeah. <laughs> I must go to Vienna. <laughs> and I, I thought, hmm, I, I, should, I should draw that, I should draw it. And of course, you know, as soon as I put the penis in the drawer and it just looked so stupid, and I realised it was the, the roller coaster was, was, was what, what, what I was doing. And I should say that there's some images coming up, they're just random images. But hopefully there is an image of this painting that I've been doing for 10 years. And it is of a penis. So if it comes up behind me, shout, penis! <laughs> <laughs> and you know, um, there was an important uh, point uh, when we set up this uh, exhibition together. And this was when the lighting man came in. Christian, who is also here to tonight, uh, today. And, uh, you know, in this first room now, with the lighting on the roller coaster on the wall, it looks like the shadow of a wood. So here is this splinters and, and, and wooden thing, and behind there is the shadow of a wood, which is nice. And other things happened in this exhibition. And if we move on now to, to the second room, there are the embroideries. Well, this, this, I really love this. So we talk about the mountain, and we talk about the roller coaster. And when you look at the embroideries you have all the same shapes, all the same shapes between the, the male figure looks like a landscape, looks, and then how she's straddled over the top of him, you have this kind of mountain, the mountain shape again. And it's just constant, like a constant, um, well, it's a repetition of, the, of this sort of, it's a thing which is, it's totally subconscious. But for me, I just saw it. It's just, I was really happy with that. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, there were, just the four uh, enormous and magnificent embroideries in this room, and we talked about how to hang it. And there was a natural position 
three on the large wall, one on the side wall, none on the wall, which is in our back when you enter the room. And there was something amiss. And we talked about Gestalt and the Gestalt not being perfect. It has not the right energy, yes. And um, suddenly it came to a solution. No, it, well, it, you got the solution. So I've been quite spoiled with this exhibition. I ended up having far more uh, Sheila uh, drawings and works on paper than, than I thought I was going to. So it was really lovely. I could then make another selection if I wanted, which was like amazing, you know, it's fantastic. But the first image that I said, I like this, but it is not going in the show, is the little girl lifting her dress up. I said, it's not going in the show. He said, why not? I said, I'm not even explaining it. It's not going in the show. That one goes, not going in the show. That's it. Bye. And it goes back to the storage. Anyway, we had this big problem with the embroideries. It didn't have the, the intensity that it should. It kind of didn't make sense somehow. Until Detard come along, he said, don't shout at me. Don't. I just want you to see something. And he put the little girl in that room. I said, fucking brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> It just immediately pulled the whole room together. And then we have the, a really correct intellectual dialogue with the embroideries and with the girl. And for me, what happened is that the, the woman is on top. Yet, yeah, it doesn't matter how much the woman is on top, there's still a level of vulnerability. If I was to have made those embroideries and had the man on top, people would have thought that the woman was in trouble or that she was being abused or there was a level of a deep level of vulnerability and i also said the same thing with the little girl lifting her dress up when people questioned that image i said if it had been a little boy with his trousers down people would have thought it was funny because there's humor in willies for example and what i loved was with the little girl even though it's her exposing herself her taking control she's of course still vulnerable and it's exactly the same with the embroideries, with the woman on top. The vulnerability still doesn't leave. Because at the end of the day, women are vulnerable. And, and for me, at this, every time I went into the room, it kept changing. The, the, the conversation between the embroideries and, and the child kept, kept going. It was, it was non-stop, and it still is. When I go in there now, I'll be thinking something else, and it will move for me, and it will change for me. And what's really important is that room is a resting. When you walk in there, you stop and you, and you look at it all and then you think. And for me, that's what art should do. Art should, art should make you think and make you stop. Yeah, and I think uh, in this exhibition, this is especially well and evidently felt as um, every of these nine rooms have a certain spell or a certain magic or a certain emotion. So there is not just the artworks on the wall, but each room I would call an artwork in the sense of an installation. So when, when we move on, in the next room there are gouaches, just gouaches by you. And um, there is now this difference, one difference we might talk about to Chile, this uh, this female who you portray on each of these squashes has no face. While most of um, Sheila's uh, portrayals have faces. How shall we explain this um, difference? Right, so there's lots of, lots of... First of all, all the gouaches are me. They're, they're self-portraits of me. But not of my mind but of my body. And it was about being over the, uh, being 50, whatever, 50 plus. And I realized that I was still drawing myself like I was 25. And I wasn't looking at myself. I wasn't, I wasn't responding to who I am now or where I'm going or, or I wasn't responding to my future. And I was in, in some kind of denial. So I made myself look at myself and then I made myself draw myself again. And that is the result of those gouaches. I don't need to put my face in my picture because I know who it is. And I also said to someone, I really love um, Courbet's Origins of the World. And when I was a student, it really wasn't 
cool to like this painting. A lot of feminists would, would be really, really angry that I liked it or whatever. And I said, but look, look how sexy she is. You know, I said, that pubic hair, you could just, you could just throw your whole body into it. You know, you're, I said, she, her, this woman, her, her personality isn't about her face. It's about her whole psyche, her whole being. And it's pulsing through that painting. I said, Corbe, that wasn't a model. I said, he was really deeply in love with her. You can see that. It emanates from the painting. It's like so visual, it's so powerful. And I really, really believe that the nature within the human being is, is reliant on so many other things and so many different layers. And I said, if someone thought that all there was to me was my face, I'd be really insulted. I walk with my left foot turned in. Um, I have really, really soft skin. They're things that you can look at and, and describe me by. But on top of that, I have my mind and I have my soul. And that all lives somewhere inside of me. And that isn't to do with my face. It's to do with all of me. And that is so important when, when, I, when I paint and when I draw. And over the last few years, I've just eradic I've eradicated a lot of the faces because it's unnecessary for me. But recently, I did um, a drawing, which I think may come up here, of me. It looks like me when I was maybe sort of, mm, like, sort of 17 or whatever and with the face, and it's quite a sexy picture. And I've kind of left it because she looks so pretty, this girl. I couldn't get rid of her face. I didn't want to. So, so interesting things happened. It's not, it isn't like a mannerism within the way I work. Sometimes I surprise myself, and there's a reason. But I'm, it, 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 I can draw a likeness of anybody. I'm actually really quite skilled drawer, but I find it unnecessary to do that because I think, as I said, the person is, it's about so much more than this. Yeah, and as you know, um, my, uh, my feeling when I come into this room and am the beholder of these uh, gouaches, um, it's always difficult to have a theory on a, on a living artist. It's so much uh, more easy to say something about a dead artist. Uh, you can say almost everything, but uh, on the other hand, it's a chance to know if one's feeling is, so to say, on, online, in line. So in this room with the gouaches, I feel that there is a certain relaxation coming from those uh, paperworks to actually relax and be authentic just as you are. And uh, for that, I think the blank space of the face is important because if there was a face of a particular person, you, I would see it from the outside and say, aha, uh -huh, that's Tracy. But now, even if this is a female body and I'm a man, uh, there is a body feeling coming towards me so that I can kind of flow with the same body feeling and not prevent myself to not like me, uh, not prevent myself to like me and just be what I am. And I think that's a, a, a really important impact of your art, to encourage people and to encourage women to be how they are and not hide behind anything. Would that be right? Yeah, yeah, right? It, it, that's exactly it. That's exactly true. Because I don't also, I don't want to be just making work about me, 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 me. It starts with me and then goes out into the world. I want people to be able to look at what I do and find some way of identifying with it with themselves. That's so, that's really important. Otherwise, it becomes, when you make work constantly about yourself, it could you know, people just imagine that you, or presume that you're just really narcissistic, but it isn't about that. You just, you, you, if anything, it's the opposite because you're constantly using yourself. You know, I think it was a quote for me when I was younger when someone was talking about me being raped, and I said, the worst rape of all was when I raped myself. You know, when you lay yourself open and bare to everything, it does make you feel, feel very um, exposed. And that's an understatement. And that's another good reason for not putting my face on it, because it's already, I'm, it's already overexposed. I'm already overexposing myself in a way. 
but there's a massive difference between me drawing me and someone else drawing me, mm -hmm. or me drawing someone else. Because I said this about even Sheila, if I'm, drawing, if I'm drawing myself and I'm really angry, I know that I'm angry. But if the life model's angry, I don't know that she's angry. She's someone else. If I'm really sad and I've been crying and I make a drawing, I'm making a sad drawing. And I know the difference. I can feel it. And, and so using yourself is, is really different. It's a, it's a cathartic thing as well. Uh, you said that you wanted to present Chile in a different and alter alternative way and getting Chile out of Austria into the international world. <laughs> and now I enter the next dark space with your animation and the grotto. And here is this young, colorful, presumably self-portrait or a young boy or a young man, let's say, sleeping, and here is this animation, here is the grotto. What is he, what is he doing? What do you think? What is your impression? Well, it's interesting, that, that portrait, I don't, I don't like all the colour in it. I don't like Sheila's when there's all that colour and all those rainbow colours. And that one for me is like a clown. It's kind of like a clown, definitely. And all the colour and the lips and everything. But it's something really intriguing about it because I see it like a clown and because it's all happy and colourful. I think that there's a deception behind it. Like it is, you know, like clowns are, you know, supposed to be really happy and we all know they're not because it's only the smile or whatever. It is like that. There's a kind of loneliness within that portrait. And in the room, there's the, uh, the film is, the animation is called Those Who Suffer Love, but we just refer to it as the masturbating film because everyone knows what we're talking about, okay? When I made that film, I made it because um, someone had over, I'd lent someone a small area of my studio and I came back from traveling to see they'd taken over my entire studio my, and, and there was nowhere for me to work. So I went off to a flea market and at the flea market, I found a box of pornographic photos from the 70s, a big box. And I bought them, and when I was going through them all, I found about 10 photos of this woman, like, pretending to be masturbating. But actually, and she was incredibly un unattractive, really, she had very, she was just really not nice to look at. The whole thing wasn't good. But when I had the 10 photos and went like that, I thought, oh, wow, we've made a really good film, like an animation film. And then I just sat at my desk, my table, and then just drew all of the, all of the, all of the drawings, but they're like with monoprints, and made this little film. And I, t I think it took me about five days to do the drawings. But what was really great was um, it really made me think about drawing and this sort of myop myopic response I was having, do making these drawings. Instead of being in my studio waving my arms around, I was actually just really focused and, and homing in on this, these masturbating drawings. And, I, and then I thought, God, it's so similar to masturbating, it's so similar to drawing. You don't masturbate with someone else, because otherwise it's not masturbating, that's sex. And you don't draw with someone else, you draw alone. I mean, I'm not talking about some kind of big performance art thing. You, as an artist, when you draw, it's a really solitary um, uh, uh, experience. It, it really is. And it's to do with your mind, your hand, um, your imagination. And I thought, wow, this is really like... This, I never realised before how similar these acts are, these acts of uh, aloneness. And so that's why in that room... It really works well with the tiny little figure in the grotto alone. And that, that grotto was originally supposed to be like a woman sitting on top of a man like that. And every time I made the male figure, um, it didn't work out. And in the end, she was just sitting in the grotto on her own. And then we've got the Sheila, which is this, what I call like the lonely clown. So, here you are. You know, when, whenever I go now with people through this room, and especially with groups, when I utter the word lon loneliness or solitude, people tend to think that I speak of something which should be avoided or which is negative, which I think is off the mark, isn't it? Yep, I love being alone. I love it. And the neon takes us into the next room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the neon, more solitude. Just, and more solitude I can have, the happier I am.
Because as an artist, I need solitude to be creative. I need solitude to be true. And the other thing as well, being an artist, adula adulation is really harmful and not good. I need to be cut off from the compliments, cut off from the ego. I need to be really solitary and on my own to have like new ideas, to rethink, to, to rejudge myself. And I'm my worst critic as well. I'm very, really critical with everything I do and why I do it. And if I don't have time or space to think about it, I literally physically become unwell and I become very depressed. I especially like this... Oh, there's uh, the drawing with yeah. the face, by the way. Well, I thought she was pretty. <laughs> um, I actually like this room very much, this dark room where the, there is a Shile poem, which is the white swan. I think you, you selected this particularly. It's about a white swan on a lake and a very short one. And uh, on the opposite wall, high up, there is this white uh, neon, more solitude. So for me, this white neon is like a swan drifting through the darkness of water. Um, when actually in your life are you, uh, do you have this solitude to yeah. work um, and be with yourself? Okay, so I have a house in France, and the house in France is situated in um, 13 whatever it is you call them here, hectares, and it's like 40 acres, and then it's in the middle of a nature reserve, and I have no neighbours, and, and also I don't speak French. <laughs> and sometimes when I'm there, like, unless I drive down the hill to get provisions, um, and I drink a lot, and, and so I can't drive if I've been drinking. I can't drive if I have a hangover as well. Because where it is, it's kind of like while it's on these hills that go round. I mean, it's crazy. Just like tiny, tiny roads. And there's like three, three 400 meter drops, you know, either side or whatever. So I have to, I kind of like um, go shopping and, get, and work out what I'm going to eat, you know, for seven days or whatever. And it's kind of like gung ho. And, you know. But I love it. And I just, I just walk around on the land. I don't get dressed. I, I, I'm not naked, but I wear my pyjamas the whole time. Um, and I don't see any people, and it's really brilliant. A lot of the time, my phone doesn't work. But I tell you what, it dri drives my studio mad, because when I go down to town, I just ring them all the time. <laughs> I don't stop talking, because I haven't, haven't spoke to anyone for three or four days. But um, I love it. Is and there one exception? Hmm? I heard that you have an occasional visitor. Yeah, I have um, a fox that comes and visits me. And when... When she was little, I saw her with her mum, and they were just sitting on the hill looking, looking into the house. And I thought, wow, that, that's so sweet, it's so beautiful, this baby fox and cub and, and the mum. And then I never saw them. And then someone told me that the mother had been killed. The gardener or the shepherd had told me this. And then the baby fox... Kept, I kept seeing her, and so I looked at what foxes ate. And foxes, actually, first of all, I tried to give her eggs, right? Not a good idea. Foxes do not eat eggs. This is kind of just some weird fable, you know. Foxes like fruit. So I got pears and fruit and whatever. And she started taking the fruit from the bowl outside. And then after, like, about a week of this, she started coming. She could just come into the house, and she'd just sit in the kitchen. I mean, never touch her, because you mustn't touch foxes. It was just brilliant. And then the gardener came up and he saw me walking with her, with this like a, like a dog, just walking through the olive grove. And he couldn't believe it, this fox. And it, she's so sweet. And now she's had cubs. And last summer when I, I, was, I was driving up the, up the drive and it was like kind of like early, just twilight, early evening, and I saw her and I thought, oh, wow, there she is. And then she just sat in the road, so in the drive. And I, so I stopped the car and looked and then these two baby cubs come out. And so she was trying to say to me, you know, I haven't seen you because this, you know, I've got cubs. It's so sweet. And I love it. It's like nice. I love nature. And I love nature. I love animals. And those things make me feel really um, complete. And really, I never want to have children. I never wanted to have children. I don't want to get married. I don't want to have a family. I would love to just become nature. 
I'd love to just walk one day and just slip into the into into just become just become the earth. We just become the sun. Those feelings make me feel really, really, really happy. And like, and if I can work in France and have those feelings, I get on such a high. I just feel like feel just like it's better than anything in the whole world. Anything. I can't think of anything that compares to it for me. I think it was uh, Gurdjieff. Or was it Uspensky who said, uh, "Animals are the shadows of God, of the gods." And there is a fox uh, in one of the small sculptures. And I would like to ask you to um, expand a little bit on this particular white fox sculpture, which you, you I think, uh, like most of these tiny white sculptures. And the fox one is my favorite one, not because of the fox in France, but I in my life, have fallen in love with people that I can never be with for one reason or another. And, it, and it's not unrequited love, it's distance, a, a distant love. And it's untouchable love or whatever. And with the fox, the, that particular one is about someone who, uh, who I love dearly. And um, it says, um, you have no idea how safe you make me feel. And really, really loving someone makes you feel safe, it makes you feel wonderful. So that's what that particular work is about, and that's why it's my favorite one, the mm -hmm. fox one. Mm -hmm. There is also a, a woman with a snake, which um, it's, a, it's a mysterious moment. I can't really understand it. It yes. just captivates me. It, and, and the writing on that, it says, um, without him there was no mirror, which I think is really funny because she's teasing the snake. And with those, with those sculptures, I wasn't afraid of making them corny. I wasn't afraid of making the statements, in, as far as I'm concerned, really obvious what they're about. And I really enjoyed the scale. And I enjoyed the fact that they, it's like they're, little, they're on a little stage acting out my thoughts or my ideas. I, I've kind of, because they're, they're so tiny. And, and it's like a little stage, a stage of life in a way. Mm -hmm. Um... In my mind, I go now back one room, and there are three Sheilas, and I would like to talk with you a little bit on, on Sheila or these Sheilas. Um, it's a reclining woman of about the middle of his uh, uh, li uh, working life. There is this um, kind of uh, muscular man seen from the back, which is right at the end of his last year. And there is this strange black uh, figure, also a man, seen from the back. So these are three very distinct and different um, um, drawings in, in one room. Was it important for you that they are so different, or do you see them as more or less the same, coming from one artist? Or what, what connection well, do you have to these three uh, drawings? I, d I don't want to... I don't want to sort of go into like um, lots of like um, technical things mm -hmm. about Egon Schiele, but I think that the later works in his life weren't as good as the earlier ones, and for different reasons from what other people think. I think that they're traced. I think he was doing a lot of photography, and then he traced and traced from the, for, for especially some of the erotic ones. Because the line is so heavy, the same. The line is the same weight. It's continual. Whereas his earlier work, the line has a different flow to it, and it's much freer. But saying, but putting that aside, what I do like about that room isn't about the works that connect within the room, but the, how they connect to the other, other, the other rooms, either side of it. There's a really brilliant dialogue, especially with the. Um, um, the more solitude room mm -hmm. with the floating figure mm -hmm. and then the two either side. Mm. Some, there's something really nice happens there. Yeah, there is this, what do you say, what you call a clown on the far end and here is this black man. And uh, one is thinking, what is the connection here? And they are about the same, the same time. So it's the black man which has some kind of aggression f for me being inside the clown, but the clown will not admit it. And there is a clown inside the black man who poses. Yeah, so it's also funny, I think. And it's 
I think they are 20 meters apart. Yeah. But there's a connection. There mm. is a connection, yeah. Mm. So um, why, why did you also select uh, later works when you say that you particularly like the early works or the expression works of Schiele? Well, I think some of them, the, the subject matter and how they actually relate to things in the show just does work exceptionally mm -hmm. well. So, and also, I don't think that you can just, you know, when we're talking about even Sheila, he died when he was 28. So when we're talking about the late works, you know, in shows of Egon Schiller's, you can have work that he did at school. You know, that's the early period. You know, and, and other artists, history, even history, you don't have that. He was 28. And he was prolific. And the amount of work that he made was incredible. And that's why you can have these different periods and these different, like, different feelings when you look at them. Mm-hmm. And um, there is also a very nice connection between the reliefs. Do you say relief in the reliefs in this room and these three drawings, especially to this 1918 uh, late uh, mus muscular man, which now in this connection is, I all, almost see it as a relief, actually. Um, the first time I saw these reliefs was at White Cube in London, and I was really surprised that you, you do these things. They, um, they looked great, but how did you come up on this idea? How did you get this idea to make reliefs in bronze and then co cover it partly in white and partly let the bronze color? Because I was working in the foundry in New York, and in the foundry there's all this, like there's this um, storeroom, and, and everywhere you see uh, works by artists from the last sort of like 90 years from how, who, you know, just stacked up or stored or whatever. And I saw really, really, really interesting relief. And I thought, wow, I've never thought of doing, you know, just drawing into the clay. All the time I'm trying to make three-dimensional things. And it was just so easy for me to do. And I thought, I love doing this. I'm going to make them in bronze. I'm going to make lots of them. Because it's just like my drawing. Oh, it's almost impossible. Almost impossible. I, can't, I still can't do any more. I've got all the things in my studio to try and do more. That, that day when I did them, they just worked. They worked wonderfully. And, and it's like often in my art process, I come across something and I think, oh, wow, I really want to do some more of them. It was so easy. It never happens again. The reason why it was so easy is because it was like magic. Mm -hmm. you know. And it was almost like it wasn't me doing it. It was just like this fantastic flow of something, you know, unlabored. There is one, um, at least one uh, of the reliefs, uh, don't show figures, but they um, they show words. There is a text written on it. Now, I went through with um, a group of the friends of the Leopold Museum, nice old, old people, elderly people, and um, they tried to de decipher what you wrote there. And they, they said, it's really very difficult to read this. And they asked me if we put a, a, a paper, a text next to it. And I said, I really don't know, and I will ask Tracy about it. What do you think? I, I, I have no idea what you, you say now, yes or no. When I made it, so there's these two, these two plaques. And one has got this sort of like, it's got a little a figure with just one leg. And then, then there's a text which goes next to it. And the text is about a really, really lonely feeling, really like iso total isolation and being alone. And when I did that plaque, I knew that the texture was going to be, because it's all my fingerprints, I knew it was going to come out really crazy. I knew exactly what was going to happen. I could have easily have just had it completely flat and then just wrote into it, but I didn't want to. I liked the mystery. I liked the fact that it was difficult. And it's heavy. It's a heavy thing. It shouldn't be easy. So it's all right that we don't put the text next yeah. to it, yeah. Hmm. And, and <laughs> I, I expected it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a similar question, which uh, sounds like a technical question, but I think uh, goes to the essence in a way, is in this room before where there is a sound installation. We, I mean, sound installation, you... Uh, read or you uh, tell us about a certain moment in your life. And again, this particular group said, ah, it's so difficult to, to uh, hear the specific words. Can't we have a text? 
Who, who, who were these hard of hearing people, you know? Hard of seeing, hard no, of hearing people. They were interested in what you do. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm teasing. Mm. Um, uh, no, nice people who want to know what they see, yeah? The, the, the sound piece, it's more solitude, is a story about... Um, I think, okay, so I read in a newspaper that a body had been found in a, in a glacier. And the body was like, you know, nearly 100 years old. And I thought, wow, that's like really incredible. And this clothing was still on him and everything. And then you hear about these things, like these kind of fable stories, like from the Dolomites or whatever, of like, you know, young couples being betrothed. And he goes off walking into the hills in his lederhosen and he never returns. So I wrote this More Solitude is a story about a woman getting dressed and ready and doing her hair. And she's going to meet her husband who, she, who one day just walked away and left her. But where she's going to meet him is, to, is they found his body in a ravine in a glacier and it's been kept in ice. So she's getting dressed and ready to go and say hello. But he is still is a young man and she's 80. And that's, you know, that's what that story is about. And the thing is, she, she always carried on loving him. And there's a lot of people that are with someone in their life and they don't love them. We can go back to the swan thing. You know, and they just... And sometimes being alone means you can love whoever you want freely. And that's what that story is about. It's a beautiful story, and it's not a sad story because she's happy with her love. It never changed. What a beautiful story. <laughs> no, you think it is I, beautiful. I don't make fun mm. of it, yeah. but... Yeah. <sighs> Do I appear ridiculous when I'm touched? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I could go on and relate more questions of this particular group, but I, I, I go back to my questions. And um, there are two uh, spaces where um, there are series of almost or seemingly the same thing, which is not, of course. And one is the embroidery room with four very alike uh, um, Motifs, and there is the lonely chair room with, um, again, a woman on a chair in the same pose, um, arranged kind of in a series. Uh, what is this with, with series? Why do you like uh, to present us series? I, I call them my cave woman drawings. And because sometimes when I'm working on something, it's not, I don't want to make more to sell. And I'll tell you what, the, the lonely chair drawings are incredibely unpopular. <laughs> they're Because they're so difficult. You know, it's not like, oh, I must have one of those really sort of like weird lonely chair drawings and hang it up in my house. You know, people don't think like that when they see those drawings. They are museum works or they are made, they're not made for any kind of, well, none of my work is really. But those works in particular have a kind of, definitely like a kind of, uh, not, it's not even aggressive. They really are lonely chair drawings, you know, and they're dark and they're foreboding. And, and I made them in France. This is really, really good. My, the person who looks after my house, um, you know, who checks it and everything when I'm away, she said, um, you know, Tracy, I really, I really don't think you should leave your art in your studio. You should, you should take it with you. And it was really, really good because in my studio, I had all the lonely chair drawings hanging up, like maybe about 20 of them or 15 of them. And I know that if anybody, you know, was like walking through the hills one day and came across my studio and opened the door and saw those drawings, they'd be so scared. <laughs> you know, it would be like, oh, my God, who the hell made them? It's almost like demonic or something. So... Um, Sometimes in my life, I've gone back to reoccurring subject matter continually, keep going back to it and back to it. And I say it's like my cave drawings. It's, it's, not, it's not like um, a drawing. It's like this motif which has been implanted in my head that has to come out. And with the lonely chair drawings, um, I was in France sitting, sitting on a chair in my kitchen. I've got this chair just sitting there, but like for about three hours just sitting there. 
And as I sat there, this tear just kind of went down my face and I thought, oh, I'm, I really am lonely. And that was it. Suddenly, I was out of my own mind and I was like a thousand feet in the air, looking down on myself, looking down on my house, looking down past the clouds, through the sky, through the roof of my house, looking at myself sitting in the chair. And I thought, oh, I've got to draw that. So, and that's how the lonely chair drawings come about, from an absolute feeling of being totally, totally isolated. So isolated that I was completely outside of myself. We are not lonely, obviously. Mm. <laughs> um, and, and you combined it with a poem by Schiele, which says, I give myself completely. Yeah, it's brilliant, that poem. Mm. And there is a young boy in this room also. I, I at least see it as a young boy. Um, I, um, I pre-selected the first selection of, of, of Schiele's. And I wanted also to um, uh, have some drawings which are not typical Schiele, which if there was not the name on the paper and it was in a contemporary gallery, you would think, aha, uh -huh, a nice thing, who is the artist? And I think this is one example here, of, at least for me. And it's again mysterious for me and uh, emotionally clear but intellectually not understandable while you put this uh, lonely man with this hunched uh, body next to the poem of I give myself completely and to the, to the lonely chair drawings. Because I think as an artist, if you don't give yourself completely, you're not an artist. And what about this young boy? He knew that he was giving himself. He was giving himself. Mm. Mm -hmm. When I, if I have never done anything but art, nothing, nothing. I never had any other career. I've never done anything. All I've ever done is art. That's all I. It's not all I've ever wanted to be. It's all I've ever done. And if I don't make art, I told you earlier, I am ill. I'm physically unwell because I need it. I need to be creative. It's like. Like I always say, if you need to cry, you have to cry, otherwise you'll have a terrible headache. You know, it's the silt of the mind that has to be released. If you need to bleed, you need to bleed, you need to shit, you need everything like that in life. You have to have, this. there has to be a release. And that's part of nature and that's part of being human. And if you're an artist, you have to create, you know, otherwise you, your hands start going strange, your heart goes strange. You need, you need it. If I don't make art, then I don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. My life makes no sense to me whatsoever. And then I start to become mentally confused and depressed because there's no meaning in anything for me. Mm -hmm. um, and um, was there a part particular moment or month or day or year in your life when you felt this is, art is my connection? To life and without art, life would actually stop. I think um, I had an exhibition once called um, I, "I Need Art Like I Need God," and um, it's not funny. It's, it's I really believe in the greater. I have a vast not not Christian or anything, but I have a vast. My favourite philosopher is Spinoza. I have a vast amount of faith in all things and all things connecting. And you know, I explained to you about you know, the land and the nature and the animals and everything. And um, I had this exhibition. Okay, this is a quick little story. I had absolutely no money at all, none. And I couldn't pay my electric. My telephone was going to be cut off. And I had no... F it, it was, like, absolutely horrific, awful. And a, a gallery in Switzerland, in Geneva sent me money to buy a slide film and they wanted artists to do the slideshow and they sent me money to buy a slide film and I then went down to Margate to see my mother and I jumped on the train without paying my fare which I shouldn't have done but I didn't have any money 
and the only money I had was this five pound that this gallery had sent me to buy. This is in about 1980, 80, 80, not 80, 1995 or something. And all I had was this £5. And then I was on the train, and as I looked, I keep, kept seeing this blue thing. And I kept thinking, what is that blue thing? It was a camera. Someone had left a camera on the train. So when I got off the train, I went to go to the guard to say someone's left a camera, but there was no one there, luckily, because I hadn't paid my train fare anyway. <laughs> and so I thought, oh. And then I thought, oh. I've got the five pound for the because I wasn't going to spend the five pound on the slide film. I needed the money. I had no money, but I thought, but I've got a camera and I've got the five. I've got to go and get the slide. This is all you know. I have to. Went and bought the slide film, and then the next day was the spring tides, and in Margate you have when the spring tides you have waves that are like twenty foot high. And the spray can go right over the cliff. And it was like this ferocious. It's where Turner, Turner lived and painted. So you have an idea of like the dram dramaticness of the sea there. And so I took, with this slide flip, I took these photos of the sea crashing over, you know. And it was really dangerous because the waves come. And I just felt, wow, this is incredible. You know, all the spray was going over me. And I had this camera and I was taking the slides. And then I got some chalk and I wrote on the sea wall. I didn't know what I was going to write, but I wrote the words, I need art like I need God. And I thought, yeah. And I took, took that, and I thought, today I could have thought about suicide, but today I thought, I need art like I need God. And I thought, that is so true, and I felt so amazing. I went and got the slides, you know, um, made up, and they were really, really, really incredible. I took the camera, I handed the camera back in, so it was like I just borrowed the camera, you know? So whoever lost their camera, they had a chance of getting it back. And I felt so high, and I felt so amazing from it. And I always thought, if I ever have an exhibition, I'm going to call it, I need art like I need God. Right. And then in 1997, I had an exhibition at the South London Gallery, and I called it, I need art like I need God. And it was my second show that I'd ever had. And when I went to the opening... I got off the bus <laughs> to my own opening, and I looked, and I, and I thought, God, that's really weird. You know, have I got the wrong time? You know, everyone's outside in the street queuing. Well, not queuing, they're just not in the exhibition. And I thought, I'm always late. And I thought, it's like, you know, it's half past six. You know, maybe it's really half past five. Maybe my watch is wrong. Maybe, anyway, when I went, what happened? There were so many people come to the show that people were having to queue outside and they were having to wait for people to leave before they could go in. And I'm going, it was my show, and I, I go in. And when I went in, there was, like, cameras, flashes, you know. There was, there was every fashion magazine, the newspapers, everything. And I just went, wow, I've arrived. That's it. I need art like I need God. This is fantastic. This is what it's all about. And I see that, and, it was, and that was when I knew, going back to this, I knew I can do this, I can do this. That's when I knew I could do it as an artist. Never before, never before. And then what happened was I kind of rode on this wave of um, celebrity, fortune and fame kind of thing, and just rode on that. That's, that was kind of like my vehicle that kind of got me through, even if it was by default or by accident, that's what kind of took me through. And then... It's only been, like I'd say, the last few years that I've regained what I call my internal true ambition. Everything that was ambition was external, created by the outside. And it's, it's only now that I have my, my total focus and ambition and understand, you know, where, as in where I want to go, for example. You know, the title of the show, you know, it's totally within me it's internal it has no effect the outside it's the inside that's important and that's what's leading me and as an artist that is such a fantastic feeling because it's unchallengeable I know I'm doing the right thing whereas before I didn't know that I had to be told I was I had to listen to other people now I'm listening to my inner self and it's not an ego thing it's the opposite actually because it's more fearful but it's a it's a fantastic feeling so recently actually 
I think maybe as an artist, you always have doubts, and you and you have to reevaluate and re, re, readjust and rethink and and go on to the next stage. I'm going to the next stage, and it's much better than the last one. I was uh, tempted now to ask if these are naturally the last word of our words of our session. Then you went on a little, and I thought, um, <laughs> yeah. When you do what you do, when you do what you're meant to do, you get gifts from the spirits. And that's the sign, signs to move on. Maybe a last question. Um, in this space here, in these spaces here in this museum, do you see your work differently? I see my work very differently here. In fact, this time last week, I saw my work so differently, I was petrified. And I was thinking, what have I done? I have opened myself up to so much criticism here. I might have made a big mistake. What have I done? And um, thanks to Christian and his wonderful lighting, I realized that I was OK. I just about pulled it off. But um, it's, um, it is different because it's a museum context, historic context a new context for myself and for Egon Schiele. And I've said this a few times this week. I want to set Egon Schiele free. I want to release him from Austria and Vienna, and from Vienna from 1910 to 1918. I want him to go forward with a new audience, with younger people, re-evaluating and, re and looking at his work. I want him to be truly international and not a national treasure of Austria. I want him to be, in, in Britain, you know, he, he isn't as, uh, as understood or even appreciated at all, actually. It's quite, you know, a lot of people haven't even heard of him. So, um, and, he, and they should, because he's one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. And, and his work should be reviewed, re-looked at, and rethought about constantly in different contexts. And what I am doing for him, he is also doing for me. Because I also, on the same hand, he's Vienna 1910 to 1918. I'm London 1990 to the year 2000. You know, I want to be released from that. I don't want to be remembered as just being a British artist that was in the 90s. I want to be set free from that. And this exhibition sets my work free from that in a, in a good way. So I think for both of us, it's a nice thing. And when, was ha when I was hanging the show, I really thought about him. And, I, and some of them, 1915, I was thinking, wow, it's like 100 years ago. And I thought when he was making those watercolour, those gouaches, I wondered if he had any sense that someone like me would be coming along and hanging them on a wall. Yeah, and that is beautiful. That's like um, alchemy. That's like something, that's magic. That's something really, really special. So, and... It doesn't matter about the 100 years difference. We have something similar, and that's what this show's about, where we want to go. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think uh, beyond my expectations, you and Carol and we all together, we have achieved this, that we look beyond appearances and uh, have a look into essential intentions, why to do this crazy thing, art. Thank you very much, you, Tracy. It's a really beautiful day out there, and I didn't expect anyone to be in this room when I walked in, so thank you very much for coming. Please sign my book, right. and I like more pencils. Yeah, I do too.